just a heads up, this video is going to be a lot of me nerding out about linguistics, so just don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, so I know that we're all freaking out about Fontaine and its really cool lore and the story and all the hidden world quest shit that does more than Aranyaka ever did with like a fraction of the length, but for those that might not know, we actually have Natlan lore. This game has been out for three years almost, and the lore we had up to this point on Natlan has been minuscule to say the least. Like, to put it into perspective, we were meeting characters from Fontaine in version 2.0, and there might have been even some more Fontanian characters roaming around Mossat and Liyue in earlier versions. We had Sumeru lore and artifact sets released in 1.0, and for Inazuma, we had pretty much the entire story of Tsurumi Island in an artifact set in 1.0. But for Natlan, as of 4.0, we have just gotten our first item to mention Natlan directly. We have not met a single Natlan NPC. We have had very little idea about what it's like and what the culture is like. All we knew was that its society was largely tribal, something we learned very, very early on in the Favonius Library, and that it probably took inspiration from cultures indigenous to South America based on the fact that the music that plays during its section in Travail for Nathlan is a tango, a form of music that originated in South America. The only thing that put Natlan ahead of other nations is the fact that we know the Pyro Archon's name, and we have known it since even before the release of the game because it was a part of the manga, before we knew the name of A, Nahida, Fosalor, any of it. Her name is Murata, and that's literally it. Before this point, we had been operating on the smallest breadcrumbs that were given to us in the very, very beginning of the game and before, and we have received nothing in regards to it since. Because of this kind of mystery, I have developed a sort of interest in Natlan. When it came to Inazuma and why their people were uncommon to find, it made sense since the people of Inazuma were literally locked inside of their own borders by force, by their Archon. So having very few Inazuman NPCs made quite a bit of sense. But even then, we had one or two people who had been floating around Liyue Harbor to talk to and learn that information from. Even though we knew that Inazuma was an archipelago off the coast of Liyue that was under a militaristic decree to close borders and let nobody in or out, we still had Inazuman NPCs to talk to and learn what the deal was in the first place. Compare that to Natlan, which, as far as we know, has no travel restrictions on its people and is a part of mainland Teyvat, and you'd expect that we'd be seeing plenty of Natlan people. But that's clearly not the case, as we have seen even less of it, and we have been given no explanation as to why we have seen or heard absolutely nothing from Natlan's people. But with the release of 4.0, we saw the release of a new set of weapons for the Battle Pass, one of which is the holy grail for people interested in Natlan lore, a weapon called the Talking Stick. The flavor text for this weapon is long and, unlike most things in this game, rather easy to parse, weirdly enough, and it gives us a very good idea of what kind of cultural influences Natlan takes from and roughly what it's like there. So before we dive into anything related to Fontaine, let's take a look at the lore of the talking stick and see what we can glean about the next nation that our journey will take us to. I'm going to split this video up into two parts. The first is just a quote-unquote brief summary of the text of the claymore so we can be on the same page and know what we're actually talking about. And then the second part will be a deep reading into the plethora of names that are just kind of thrown at us and their linguistic and mythological origins. And then after that we can start theorizing about Natlan. So let's get summarizing. So first of all, let's talk about the name of the weapon. It's easy to think that the name of this claymore is saying that it's a stick that can actually talk, but that's not quite it. The name of the weapon in Chinese is Liao Liao Bang. Liao Liao here being the word for like a chat or a conversation in a very casual tone, which is to say that it, this is a stick that you have a conversation over or with in the presence of whatever. Or if you'd rather, it's a stick that does the discussion for you via violence, since the Japanese word for the weapon is kind of a pun that can be translated to death discussion stick. Pretty much, its name insinuates that it's a diplomacy tool used to have peaceful dialogues, either by way of ceremony or by way of assured destruction by the holder of it. Either you have a peaceful discussion discussion or you get smashed by this weapon kind of thing. It's implied by the story that the weapon is used in both ways or can be used in both ways. Since we know Natlan is the nation of war, it makes sense that the threat of immediate death or destruction would probably be one of the few ways to get people to sit down and actually chat through the diplomacy instead of just fighting. So the actual description of the stick opens with the description of a man named Tenoch looking out upon vast burning plains with a black tide welling above the horizon in the distance, which is 
probably the Cataclysm of 500 years ago, since it matches the description of the black stuff accented with red that we see in We Will Be Reunited trailer. He blows a bronze horn and places his obsidian club onto his shoulder, and then somebody speaks. Whether it's Tenoch talking to himself in the third person, or someone else entirely like a narrator, is unclear. Either way, they say, The crisis emerges, yet the tribal leaders bicker endlessly. Let Tenoch bring his talking stick over and let it mediate the discussion. Tenoch belongs no longer to any tribe, yet his fury still burns unquenched. Something I want to point out real quick is how the cataclysm is described here. It's described as a rolling tide that emerges instead of just a thing that happened all at once across Tevat. So certain civilizations were hit by the effects of the cataclysm after others, which also means that some civilizations were presumably hit with a less intense cataclysm depending on how far away they were at the moment of the eruption. But I digress. So here's the format of the story. Tenoch goes to six different tribes and speaks to representatives from each tribe, two from each except for the last one, and pretty much convinces them to put aside their bickering and war to come together and fight for their homeland and stave off the cataclysm. Each person he talks to is given a very specific and forceful adjective which implies both their role in Tenoch's council as well as the kind of people their tribe is. For example, the first tribe that he goes to, he speaks to a great runner named Wanjiru and her companion Kayek. They offer absolutely no resistance to Tenoch, immediately agreeing to help Tenoch fight for the burning lands of Natlan. The second tribe he goes to, Tenoch meets the brave Menelik and his companion Ngoubu. At this meeting, somebody, presumably Menelik, says, Come, come, though every tribe has chased you from their sight, though we are always at odds. But in my eyes, you, club-carrying Tenoch, are a hero among heroes, a brother amongst brothers. Third is the cunning Sanhaj Kompore and his companion Mahamba. The text says that Sanhaj had been persuaded by the talking stick before, and so agreed to join and even give his spoils to Tenoch. Then a really strange line is spoken, which I'll read here verbatim. Kompore had foreseen his and Tenoch's heroic end, and how that place that would become known as the Merjivari in later days would be born. But nay, it matters little. It matters not. Perhaps there may come a day when the scoundrel made famous for being clever as a viper shall become a hero. So this is, this just kind of passes you by, but it is very big, and I'll talk about the implications more towards the end of the video, but this line answers a couple of questions with regards to the marriage of Vari, something we've heard plenty about, but haven't actually gotten solid answers as to what and why it is. First of all, it confirms that the marriage of Vari is in Natlan, which I've had my reservations about for a very long time. Second, it implies that the Mare Javari isn't a domain and instead is just a place, but that's less assured and it could still be a domain. And finally, it places a timeline as to when the Mare Javari was created, which is the most important part because it is no more than 500 years old. The Mare Javari is, for all intents and purposes, a new addition to this world. The fourth pair consists of the young Burkina and his reckless companion Kongamato, who are described to have willingly joined Tenoch. The next few lines really hammer home a point that Burkina and Kongamato are young, as it describes the many scars and wounds Tenoch bears that are absent from Burkina and presumably Kongamato's skin, which serves as an example of what Burkina has to face when marching with Tenoch. Quote, Revolution should be the fate of the young, to bleed for burning justice rather than rotting on a comfortable bed of grass. That sounds a lot like it would belong in a Fontaine story, but you know, we'll, we'll don't mind that. Fifth is the chief of the mines, Sundiata, and his steady companion, Muhuru. Sundiata then says, For the stability of all the tribes, and to avoid further conflict, I once partitioned the Pyro Archon to vote for your expulsion. But even today, you have yet to give up on bloody battle. It just as well, then, that this may be the final battle of our generation. If you are so determined to go, then I have no reason not to accompany you, but do not involve my tribe. This is the first time in the story that it is explicitly stated that somebody goes along with Tenoch, but does not bring along their tribe. This is also the first person that explicitly states that they have a past with Tenoch. But besides that, there's nothing huge here, really. The last one, however, the sixth person that joins Tenoch, the only person that isn't a pair, is incredibly interesting. He's described as a giant, Tupac, who is described as being Tenoch's greatest foe in his youth. Tenoch's meeting with Tupac consists of Tenoch counting his scars and major injuries and attributing all of them to Tupac, to which they laugh together, shake hands, and then team up. 
The last two lines of this text say that Tenoch had successfully teamed up with all six of the major tribes and that, quote, glittering like the flame of roaring wildfire, they crashed into the mountains of darkness, which is to say together they went to battle with the forces of the cataclysm. So let's actually talk about the names and the mythological references because there are so many in this text and they are all incredibly obscure and weird. But before we can do that, I need to talk about my approach I'm taking here since how I approach these names informs my reading very heavily. So if you don't know, I have a particular interest in linguistics. When it comes to researching cultures and history, I usually frame it around a linguistic lens since that's what I can understand the best and that's just kind of how I parse the world. Because of the fact that the names all come from a large variety of incredibly distinct cultures, I'm going to talk about the linguistic origins of the names as a way to ground myself as well as identifying what cultures Natlen might be pulling from, since there are a lot of names in this and it gives us a lot to work with. And since I largely roughly know what I'm talking about with languages, and since the names in this weapon description are from language families I show the most interest in, I'm sure as shit going to use my knowledge to place what I can. So usually when we do this, when we're given just a bunch of names for an upcoming nation, we have a very good basis for the cultural influences of the nation that we're talking about from whatever information that we got prior. Which means that we usually can go straight into researching what it might be referencing in folklore and mythology or that culture, but that's not the case here. So take a lot of these cultural identifications with a very big grain of salt since I am incredibly white and I'm not anywhere near an expert on these cultures in their history. One final note, uh, there are only a handful of names that we can really pin down the origins of incredibly easy here. The rest of them are all names that could be references to a multitude of things, some of which are so obscure I don't think even they're worth mentioning, but are also vague and common enough to possibly not be vague references. Either way, I'm not going to dive into the mythology or specific names or creatures too too much, that's not my main goal here. My main goal is to give a foundation that allows us to speculate and theorize what is up with Natlan and its cultural influences. With all of that out of the way, let's start with the two names that are of South American origin, Tenoch and Tupac. The name Tenoch comes from the Nahuatl languages of Central America. Tenoch historically was a ruler of the Aztecas during the 14th century when that group of people moved from Atlan, the ancestral home of the Azteca, and multiple other Central American peoples to Tenochtitlan. There is a lot of debate as to whether or not Tenoch was a real person, as is the case with a lot of sources relating to ancient tribes and societies in Central America around this time, but a lot of stories and records regarding Tenoch are largely consistent enough regarding the major details that it's quite possible that he was a real person in the same way that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. An interesting note, the name Tenoch comes from Nahuatl, yes, but in a slightly different way than you would expect. Since Nahuatl isn't really a single language in the same way that Chinese isn't a single language. They're both an umbrella term for multiple different dialects. The term Nahuatl is referring to a small group of Uto Aztecan languages, of which there are up to 30 depending on who you ask. So when I'm referring to Nahuatl, keep that in mind. So this language, as is the case with most Uto Aztecan languages, is incredibly agglutinative meaning that its grammar works by tacking on a lot of small particles, also known as suffixes, onto words, making longer compound words that have a more complex meaning to them. Sometimes with some agglutinative languages, you can build entire sentences into what is effectively one word. Keep this in mind since this directly contrasts with some of the languages that we're going to be talking about here in a bit. The only other character in this that has a name that is from the Americas is Tupac, the giant that Tenoch recruits. Along with having a name of unique origin, which we'll get into, he also is the only person that Tenoch goes to that doesn't meet him with some companion. Tupac faces Tenoch alone, possibly because they know each other or they know that the talking stick is not needed, but either way, it sets Tupac apart immediately. The other thing that sets Tupac apart is his name, which is taken from Quechua, again a family of languages, although all of the languages that today fall into the Quechuan family all descended from a proto-Quechua, which was spoken by the Incan Empire that stretched through the Peruvian highlands. The word literally means royal thing and was a title given to notable Inca officials, although not always rulers. Quechua as a language is somehow even more agglutinative than Nahuatl, which is 
a feat because Nautil is insane. And you'd be hard pressed to find an isolating language that originates from the Americas. From northern languages like Anuktitut and Nuhalk, all the way down to Quechua and similar South American languages, a lot of them, and like a weirdly large number of them, prefer to communicate via long words with many grammatical suffixes instead of isolating those particles and making them their own words like in Mandarin. And the reason I say this is twofold. One, just so you can mentally prepare to learn how to pronounce some unspeakable unspeakably complicated and long words, but two, because the linguistic contrast between these indigenous American languages and languages that every other name comes from is absolutely fascinating and feels pretty starkly black and white. Let me show you what I mean. So the first group that Tenoch ends up meeting are named Wanjiru and Kayeke. Both of these names are of the same origin, and I'll give you a couple of seconds to guess where their names might come from. You can guess the country, region, specific language if you're daring, whatever. Ready? If you guessed Swahili, then you'd be correct. Yeah, we're on pretty much the other side of the world now. We're talking about Central Africa, which is where all of the names of the humans come from. Every single one of them comes from either a Bantu language or some other Niger-Congo languages, with some exceptions we'll get there. So let's talk about classification, because I know I probably lost a lot of you by saying those big words. Much like how taxonomists name animals with broad categories slowly descending into more and more specific subgroups, linguists do that with languages. They're called families and subfamilies. One of these families is the proposed and absolutely massive Niger-Congo family of languages, which encapsulates most of sub-Saharan Africa. And for those linguistic nerds out there, yes, I understand that Niger-Congo is a bit of a contentious subject, but I'm using it entirely as a classification tool, and I'm not saying that I believe that Proto-Niger-Congo is a language. Okay, cool, cool. All the names of these humans can be traced to one Niger-Congo language or another, and while a large portion fall into the Bantu subfamily of languages, there are some outliers. But Every single one fits or can be fit into a Niger-Congo superfamily. So, for example, Wanjiru and Kayeke are both names of Swahili origin, a language that sits very soundly into the Niger-Congo family region, and even is one of those Bantu languages I was talking about. Swahili is what you would call a more analytic language as compared to the agglutinative language nature of Nuatl and Quechua, which pretty much means that it's a language that still deals with particles, but the rules within how those particles connect and what particles connect can go where are very strict and much more limiting. The main thing that makes a Bantu language a Bantu language is how they deal with nouns in their extremely extensive noun cases. Think gender in Spanish or French, but with like 10 genders. So immediately you can tell we're already a far cry from the highly agglutinating languages of Udo Aztec and Quechua, and it only gets further and further from those. Next is Menelik and Ngobu. These two are the hardest to pin down since Menelik could be a reference to King Menelik of the Ethiopian Empire, but there isn't really a whole lot to go off of there. And Ngobu as a name can be traced to a bunch of different languages. The most likely is a language called Baka, spoken by the Baka Pygmies of Gabon and Cameroon. The name translates in that language as something around the lines of horned one or simply just animal. The next two are also pretty tough to track down, Sanhaj Kompore and Mahamba. I'm going to start with Mahamba since the first guy is a doozy. So Mahamba is a word from the Luvale language which means ancestor and is the only place that I could find where the word appears as any sort of name. The Luvale people live in Angola and Zambia and the language is of Bantu origin so we're going to see a similar structure and phonetics to something like Swahili. Okay, so the name Sanhaj is something I really can't track down, but I can find information on Sanhaja, which was a tribal confederation that existed in North Africa, most notably in the countries of Algeria, Libya, and Burkina Faso. Compore as a name is most prevalent in, wait for it, Burkina Faso. Now, I have no idea why this guy and the next few really center around Burkina Faso in particular, but they do. The only reason I can think why this is the case is because the country is where a lot of speakers of Volta Congo languages are, and a lot of these next few names borrow from Volta Congo languages, but I, I really have no clue. So after that is Burkina and Congamato. 
Burkina, the same word as in Burkina Faso, is a word from the Moray language, or Mossi, depending on who you ask, which means roughly to stand tall or a tall one. The language is spoken by the Mossi people, numbering around 8 million that inhabit most of that area around Burkina Faso. Moray is a Volta Congo language, which generally means that it is very, very highly isolating, kind of like Igbo if you've ever read Things Fall Apart. And its grammatical particles are kept on their own and aren't tacked onto any words. Kongamato, on the other hand, derives from the Kowande language, which brings us back to the DRC in Kenya and the Bantu family. Why these two are together, I have no clue. Finally, the last pair of people is the chief of the mines, Sundiata, and his companion, Muhuru. Sandiata seems to be an alternate spelling of Sandiata, spelled differently like this, which is the name of an emperor of the Mali Empire, which existed somewhere between the 13th and 17th century. The companion's name again probably comes from Swahili, since the only trace of the word Muhuru I could find is in reference to a valley in Kenya, deep in the Swahili-speaking area. Okay, so why did we just do that? Why did we just go through every name and grab the etymology of every single one? Well, I mostly wanted to demonstrate one thing, that the cultures that Hoyo is seeming to pull from with regards to Nathlan is incredibly diverse and vast. I decided to take a more linguistic approach, partly because that's what I know best, but also because linguistics provides a very solid look into the cultures that we're talking about. Ethnic groups in Africa are incredibly diverse. You could just walk down the block and you're talking about a different ethnic group. And the Niger-Congo linguistic area is one of the most diverse linguistic areas just behind Papua New Guinea. And since we're taking influences from different cultures in different corners of Africa, as well as different time periods, we're going to see an incredibly diverse mix of cultures and designs and people, supported mostly by this idea of tribalistic warrior society. If I had to guess, the six tribes that we are going to meet in Natlan are going to take influences from one or two of these ethnic groups each, with each tribe being unique and distinct in their own way. Obviously, I think the giants, or whoever Tupac belongs to, will be based on the Inca, but we have five other tribes to talk about. Based on the names alone, I think we're going to get at least an Ethiopian Empire tribe, a Swahili slash Central African inspired tribe, a Volta Congo tribe that encompasses Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, and surrounding nations, which is where Ayansen would be from since her name does come from Yoruba, a Volta Congo language, possibly a Southern African tribe, and a Northern slash Saharan tribe. The only outlier that we have is obviously Tenoch, but that makes sense since he is stated to be a lone wolf belonging to no specific tribe. And I think this tribalistic approach might be an answer to the question that we've had in our minds since the beginning of this game. Why haven't we seen a single person from Natlan? Because they have no reason to leave. Their culture is self-centered and about the good of the tribe and the people around them. They don't have a reason, and depending on how hard the cataclysm hit them, they might not even have the ability to care about what lies beyond their lands. I think the last thing I want to talk about here is a line that can slip you by if you don't pay attention. This weapon implies how the Mare Javari came to be and actually places a when to its creation. Again, the line reads, Kompore had foreseen his and Tenoch's heroic end and how the place that would become known as the Mare Javari in later days would be born. So this implies that both Sanhaj, Kompore, and Tenoch died in the fight that takes place after the story of this weapon. But it also implies that the Mare Javari is a place in Natlan that was created during or after the Cataclysm. That actually gives us a surprising amount of information and allows us to place things like the events in the Lava Walker artifact set as happening within the past 500 years, which is much more recent than I would expect a 1.0 artifact set like that to take place. But it also gives us an incredibly direct tie to the Cataclysm, since it was a direct result of it. The Mare Javari was a direct result of the Cataclysm, and it still might be infested by that dark, goopy energy shit that we saw in We Will Be Reunited. So I don't really have a way of wrapping this video up. Really what this weapon gives us is enough information to actually start making theories, since it kind of provides this connective tissue that we can use to connect the previous Natlan breadcrumbs that we got before. So there is so much more theorizing to be done with regards to Natlan when we start to look at the Mare Javari lore and other bits that we've gotten. So after we finish with Fontaine, I think this weapon alone will act as the linchpin for a Natlan speculation until we get something more substantial and present, hopefully a person to talk to. But we're just getting started with Fontaine, so let's talk about it while it's here, since I have so many thoughts regarding Furina and the prophecy and all of the shit that happened in 4.0 and the shit that might be happening in subsequent chapters. Chapters. But I wanted to talk about this while it was new and fresh, so now that I got that out of my system, I'll see you when we get to actually talking about Fontaine.